Holiday Salt House, Pastor Sari here leading worship vi- by video as I continue just working through some concussion symptoms that were reprised because of a head bonk about three weeks ago. And uh, speaking publicly live is just a lot for a concussed brain. So I continue to improve, which I'm grateful for. And as always, when this happens, there's so much like good soul work that is happening for me as I live through these challenges. So I'm just grateful for your prayers and your understanding. And I am hopeful that by conserving my brain capacity, by filming ahead of time, that I'm there with you in the room and able to be in worship here on this Pride Sunday, right? Happy Pride, y'all. Woo! Cool. So... I'm just here to offer a quick word of introduction to our sermon time together today. So let me orient you to uh, where we've been for this month. So we kicked off the month of June with Pentecost Sunday, remembering how the Spirit of God was given by Jesus, given to the new community of Jesus followers. And though Jesus was gone, his presence was there with them in a new way, so that what Jesus had begun, the restoration and reconciliation of all things on earth to God, all of that, the Spirit was given so that all of that could catch fire and burn and spread like wildfire through what Jesus' followers would do, so through them because of that Spirit. And it does. This way of Jesus catches on. It spreads like wildfire. And it's remarkable to watch what this early community of Jesus followers do together in the book of Acts. This movement of the way of Jesus that rallied against the Roman Empire that stood up for the oppressed and made a way for love. And the truly astounding thing, again, is how inclusive it was that this community went from being mono-ethnic, nationalistic community to multi-ethnic, global community, drawing people of every class, gender, culture, origin, ability. Like, this just simply didn't happen like that back then. It's why, as we spent time in the book of Acts this June, as it is Pride Month, this sermon series is simply called Acts of Inclusion. For that's what this book is about, the Spirit of God moving like wildfire as it sweeps across the Roman Empire with radical inclusion for all people. All people. More and more room is made at the table for everyone, which is pretty amazing. And so today, today we finish the conversation. Really, it's never over, right? But we're going to... Conf- We're going to end this particular conversation with the book of Acts on this Pride Sunday with a special guest preacher, June Young. So June is the founder and CEO of Zoom Communications, which is an award-winning digital storytelling and communications agency here in Seattle. With more than 20 years of experience in corporate communications, June's passion is to help people and organizations communicate with remarkable impacts, which just resonates with us here at Salt House, right? Because one of our core practices is that stories matter, right? And that's what June's company does. Um, They quote Victor Hugo, who said, nothing is more powerful than an idea whose time has come. And so Zoom, his company, they help get that idea out when the time has come, which is pretty great. So prior to Zoom, June served as Microsoft's Director of Communications. He was named by the Puget Sound Business Journal as one of the region's most notable entrepreneurs. And then where we intersect with June's story is through Beloved Arise. In 2020, June founded Beloved Arise, and he currently serves as Director of the Board. So as you may know, may remember, Beloved Arise is the first national organization dedicated primarily to empowering youth to proudly embrace both their faith and their queer identity. Their mission is to celebrate and empower LGBTQ plus youth of faith. So currently they focus on resources for teens across all faiths, and that vision is expanding as well. So we here at Salt House, so, you know, we as a community one year ago, We started on July 1st, 2021. We committed to taking what Jesus says to heart, that where our treasure is, there our heart will be also. So we intentionally chose to give money where we want our hearts to go. And we did that with uh, a piece of that was including 1% of our offerings that they would go directly into our reparations fund, right? As well as 1% going into the work uh, that we do with queer advocacy and ministry. Because queer and BIPOC folk, man, have been historically and currently harmed by the church. And we, we wanted to put money directly 
directly into that work of reconciliation and reparation. And we have been giving from that 1% of our shared offerings from the Queer Fund to Beloved Arise as part of what we've been doing with those resources that we have. That's where our heart has been going. And so we are just thrilled to have June with us today as the founder and board director of Beloved Arise, for we are so, so grateful for the life-saving, faith and queer-affirming work that Beloved Arise is doing to spread that inclusive embrace of Jesus wider and wider. So thank you for being here, June. We are so grateful full and we are so delighted. Friends, will you please offer a warm Salt House welcome to June Young. What an honor, honestly. What an honor it is to meet the good people of Salt House here in this room and also online. Happy Pride Sunday. Oh my goodness. Pride Sunday. Wow. That's, I'm, I'm uh, joined here uh, by my beautiful groom, my fiance, Drew. Uh, you're getting married in less than two weeks at our church by our pastor. And I'm also joined here by our very dear friends, Corey and Jess Latusek. So thank you to them as well. Thank you for inviting me uh, to speak today. So over the past three Sundays, we've been exploring key acts or key moments in the book of Acts where God reveals this, this grand strategy, this, this agenda to make room for everyone to belong. Everyone, everyone, Jews, Gentiles, rich, poor, saints, sinners, men, women, and those in between and beyond. All kinds of people, especially those living in the margins, rejoice when they hear this radically inclusive gospel of Jesus Christ. But as it goes throughout human history, whenever radical inclusion is preached, radical exclusion is threatened and reacts with brutal force, as is the case with Saul of Tarsus, a.k.a. Paul. How did this unlikely apostle, who was inflicting acts of persecution, how did he go from that to committing the rest of his life to acts of inclusion? Let's travel back to the road to Damascus and find out. And I believe, I believe if we pay close attention and see with fresh eyes, we may find that Saul's story is our story. Let's dig in as I read Acts chapter 22, verse, verses 2 through 16. Then Paul declared, I am a Jew born in Tarsus, of Cilicia, but brought up in this city. I studied, un, studied under Gamaliel and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. I was just as jealous, I was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. I persecuted the followers of this way to their death, arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison as the high priest and all the council can themselves testify. I even obtained letters from them to their associates in Damascus and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. About noon, I came near Damascus. Suddenly, this bright light from heaven flashed around me, and I fell to the ground, and I heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. My companions saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. What shall I do, Lord? I asked. Get up, the Lord said, and go to Damascus. 
There you will be told all that you have been assigned to do. My companions led me by the hand into Damascus because the brilliance of the light had blinded me. And then a man named Ananias came to see me. He was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. He stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment, I was able to see him. Then he said, The God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth. You will be his witness to all people of what you have seen and heard. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Jesus of Nazareth, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to your sight. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In your name we pray, amen. When we're first introduced to Saul earlier in the book of Acts, it was because he was assisting in the stoning of Stephen. Stephen, the disciple Stephen, uh, who becomes the first martyr of the Christian faith. But Saul's toxic crusade doesn't end with Stephen. Acts 8 says, quote, Saul began to destroy the church, going from house to house, dragging off both men and women and putting them in prison. This man seems hell-bent in crushing these rebel Jews who are preaching the message of Jesus. So if, if the New Testament were Star Wars, I mean, who would Saul be? Darth Vader, right? But why is the question. Why is this, this, this man of God, this rabbi, Saul, so committed to the persecution of others? Well, in verse 3 of the passage we just read, Saul gives us an answer. It's because he is zealous for God. Derived from the Greek word zelos, to be zealous means to have an ardor or a fervent spirit. The root ze literally means hot enough to boil. This man is zealous for God. But being zealous for God is a good thing, right? I mean, that's what I learned going to church, going to church camps, right? Youth groups. You're supposed to be zealous for God. You're supposed to be enthusiastic and passionate. You're supposed to be bold in defending your faith. All in, on fire, no matter what. But in Saul's case, his zeal for God has mutated into an all-consuming paranoia. He has moved to the dark side. He's afraid. He, he sees these, this, this Jesus movement as a dangerous threat. God gave us these rules for a reason, and these people, they mock them. They're spreading blasphemous lies about this, this, this Messiah. They're, they're redefining salvation. They're changing the rules of who's in and who's out, and what if they succeed? What happens to us? God's chosen ones. What happens to me? My position, my place in the kingdom of God. As Yoda says to young Anakin before he becomes Darth Vader, fear of loss is the path to the dark side. But there's something I need for us to pay attention to today, okay? I don't want us to miss this. Saul doesn't see anything wrong with what he's doing. He sees this real threat at hand, and he's courageously doing God's work to address this threat. From Saul's vantage point, he is not a villain. He is a hero. 
zealous for God, willing to defend his faith no matter what it takes, even if it means being cruel to others. When someone is pious and paranoid, they can justify even the most horrific acts of persecution. I've seen this firsthand. I've witnessed this firsthand in my work with LGBTQ youth. I've pleaded with parents and pastors, good Christians, the best Christians, who, who can't seem to understand that what they're doing to these little ones is inhumane and ungodly. There's one story that, that continues to haunt me. It's this mom, this mom that, that had become so militant about disciplining her transgender child that in a moment of thoughtless rage, she tells this kid, this 16-year-old kid who had attempted suicide twice already, she tells this kid, maybe you should just cut deeper next time. I think, like Saul, this mom is zealous for God, but also blinded by severe paranoia. She's afraid of losing something, so she defends her belief system, no matter the cost. See, when you're in the state of pious paranoia, there's very little room for feedback, because you see everything you're doing is right. There's very little room for curiosity because you're 100% certain that you know everything. There's very little room for compassion because the stakes are high and the opposition cannot be trusted. They have an agenda, okay? And I believe Saul would have spent the rest of his life devoted to persecution without ever really knowing the error of his ways. If, if he had not encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus. If Jesus had not staged a divine intervention to open his eyes and change his heart. Let's see. Let's pay attention to how Jesus does this, okay? All right, so on the road to Damascus, Jesus tells Paul directly, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? I think this question is simple but immensely profound. It's what changes Saul's heart. It's what challenges his thinking. And I believe at the heart of this question, Jesus is trying to challenge Saul's thinking by drawing him into relationship, inclusion. Notice, Jesus calls out to him by repeating his name twice, Saul, Saul. So in Hebrew tradition, the act of doing this, of, of repeating someone's name twice, uh, reveals um, a closeness, an intimacy with the person that you're speaking to. In all of scriptures, God only does this about eight or nine times, right? He says, Moses, Moses, bring my people out of Egypt. Abraham, Abraham, don't touch that boy. Martha, Martha, why I got to be so stressed? <laughs> Saul, Saul. When Jesus addresses Saul in this intentionally personal, familiar, intimate way, it's as if to say, Saul, Saul, I know you. I know your heart. I know your devotion to God. I know. Jesus makes Saul feel known. With the simple question, Jesus also calls out Saul's behavior for what it is, persecution. Jesus doesn't sugarcoat it. He doesn't beat around the bush. He calls it for what it is. But notice, Jesus doesn't command Saul to stop persecuting right? Instead, 
he challenges Saul to search himself and interrogate his motives. Why are you doing this? He says. Listen to Jesus' words. I hear care in his inquiry. He asks why because he cares about Saul, the state of his heart, the condition of his soul that's so gripped in pious paranoia. He's saying, Saul, Saul, these, these acts of violence, these acts of hatred betray who you are and what you value. You are filled with rage instead of love. Why? Why do you do it? And finally, in a brilliant move, oh, Jesus places himself at the center of Saul's violence. He doesn't say, why do you persecute them? Why do you hurt them? He says, why do you persecute me? It recalls Jesus' parable in Matthew 25, where he tells the disciples, if you are unkind or unwelcoming or merciless to the, to the least of these, it's as if you're doing this to me. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? When you persecute people, Saul, you persecute me. The blinded rabbi is then led by hand to Damascus, where he meets Ananias, a disciple of Jesus who knows full well of Saul's war against them. But instead of rebuke, Saul receives a warm welcome. Ananias calls him Brother Saul, restores his sight, and tells him, the God of our ancestors has chosen you has chosen you. You are chosen. You're included. Saul receives an extravagant welcome that melts away his paranoia. This road to Damascus was the cataclysmic turning point in this man's life, and he wasn't even looking for it. It changes everything for Saul. The story of his life is now told and summed up in what happens before Damascus and after Damascus, right? Before, God was someone he revered and obeyed and feared from, from a distance. But now, God is someone who comes close to him, calls him by name, someone who invites him into relationship. After meeting Jesus, I believe Saul's zeal for God doesn't change. I think he is just as zealous for God as he was before. What has changed, what has changed his, is his understanding of who God is. What has changed is his understanding of his relationship with God. What has changed is that he now knows what it means and doesn't mean to be included. Scales fall off from his eyes. His thirst for violence is replaced with a hunger for righteousness and a mission to preach the radically inclusive gospel that requires no persecution. It's convenient, my friends, to see Saul and others like him as wicked, bloodthirsty villains. Darth Vader's. It's convenient. That way we can point to them and say, thank God I'm not like that. But if, what if Saul is just a man of God? What if Saul is just sincere in his devotion but blinded by fear? I think if we consider that, I think if we pay attention to Saul's motives, you know that thing that Jesus was so curious about? Why? We might see that there's a little bit of Saul in each of us at various times in our lives. 
Maybe like Saul, we get so obsessed with following the rules, protecting our territory, pre pre preserving our comfort, defending God, that we justify our own acts of persecution. But the good news is this. If we, see, if we have eyes to see, if we have ears to hear, we can encounter Jesus on our own road to Damascus, where we face the ugly truth and get a chance to make it more beautiful. For me, the road to Damascus was about the persecution I inflicted towards myself. I've been a Christian all my life. I, I go, go to church. I went to a Christian college. I attended... Um, I, I attended Bible studies. I led Bible studies. I served on mission trips. You could say, like Saul, I was zealous for God. All in, on fire, no matter the cost. So imagine in middle school, when I started noticing that, that I'm attracted to guys, I was confused and terrified. Like, wh where does this come from? Why am I like this? And how can I make it go away? I didn't have anyone to talk to that felt safe, and so I just decided to bottle it in and hope it would work itself out. It didn't. I tried praying, asking God to heal me, but that always felt awkward and fake because the truth is, even though I didn't want to be gay, it felt so good to have a crush on somebody to imagine what it would be like to hold his hand and, and go out on a date and fall in love and have my first kiss. You know, all the, all the fun things that other teenagers get to do out in the open. But I realized early on that these are things that would not be available to me, at least not in the real world. I had to accept that my longings would have to be hidden in my dreams, locked in the, in the four walls of a closet. For the longest time, I treated my queerness as a parasite, as a demon that was trying to possess me, and so I would rebuke it in Jesus' name. And I lived in the cycle of shame for decades. Self-persecution as piety. Self-hate as spiritual practice. But then, and five years ago, this month, I encountered Jesus on my own road to Damascus. I was sitting on the couch in my counselor's office. I had been in therapy for almost a year, pouring my heart out, telling things about myself that I'd never told anyone before, except not once, that I ever talk about my sexuality until that day. I took a deep breath and I, I said it out loud for the first time ever, I'm gay. I said it because I was just so tired of keeping it inside. I, I'm tired of feeling so ashamed of myself. And so I said it, I said it to him, I said, I said I'm gay. And I know you're a Christian. I don't know how you feel about all this, whether you think it's a sin or it's not, whatever. And I just don't really care about that. I just needed to let the, get this out. I needed to tell somebody. And my counselor, this, this kind, soft-spoken, older gentleman, looked me straight in the eyes and smiled ear to ear and said, I'm proud of you. And I think God is proud of you. It was only a few years ago that I realized that who I am is not a mistake or a curse. That my capacity to love and my longing for intimacy are God-given gifts. And the healing that I desperately needed was not about fixing my queerness, but dismantling my shame. 
and to hear the voice of Jesus on my road to Damascus saying, June, June, why do you persecute me? You see, when you persecute others, when you persecute people, including yourself, you persecute Jesus. But if we stop, if we listen, we can hear him saying, my child, my child, I know you. I made you. So you can put down that sword and rest in my love for you. Like Saul, when we experience the radical inclusion of Jesus, when we have the blessed assurance that we are unconditionally beloved, it sets us free to let go of acts of persecution and pursue acts of inclusion. When I felt the, the belonging I had in Jesus as a gay man, I was compelled to extend that belonging to queer youth who've become outcasts in their homes, in their churches, in their schools, in their youth groups. Beloved Arise is the loving community that I wish existed for young June. I wish it was there before the trans kid was disowned by their family and now wants nothing to do with anything Christian. I wish it was there for the girl before she was kicked out of youth group and the worship band, and to this day can't hear a worship song without getting triggered. I wish it was there for every young life the church has lost to suicide. Whenever, wherever queerness is viewed as a liability or a threat to furthering the kingdom of God, persecution is an unavoidable consequence, a necessary evil. And I want us to be clear about something, okay? These young people, they are not persecuted because of their queerness. They are persecuted because they, they have the audacity to call themselves followers of Jesus Christ. They are not persecuted because they're queer. They're persecuted because they have the audacity to call themselves followers of Jesus Christ. They dare to show up at church. They dare to show up at youth group proud of who they are in Jesus. That's what they're persecuted for. These little ones are persecuted for their faith. And we may not be able to change the hearts of the Sauls in their lives, but what we can do is walk alongside them as their siblings in Jesus Christ and say that you are beloved. I know other people have given you other names, but your real name is beloved. And when you're ready, you can rise up to your rightful place at this bountiful table that Jesus has prepared for all of us. Thank you, Salt House. Thank you for being co-laborers in our work with queer youth and young adults. Thank you for championing acts of inclusion right here at Salt House and to the ends of the earth. In closing, like that's, that's the sweetest words, right? <laughs> at church. <laughs> in closing, beloved, my hope is that more and more of us encounter Jesus on the road to Damascus and awaken to the truth of our ways and realize that we can lift God up without pushing people down. That the radical inclusion of Jesus is one we don't have to work for, be afraid of losing, or defend with our violence. Let us rediscover that the heart of God is a self-sacrificing love. And remember, and re-remember that God does not need defending. People do. 
Are you willing? Are you willing to see Jesus in the people that you fear and reject? Are you willing to turn the other cheek instead of throwing the first punch? Are you willing to lend a hand instead of pointing the finger? Are you willing to go after the one instead of protecting the 99? Why do you persecute me? He asks. Why indeed? Pray with me. Jesus of Nazareth, thank you for always coming near to us, especially in those moments when we've, we've wandered far away, far away from you and far away from who you've called us to be in this world. Remind us, Lord, that in you we live and move and have our being. Help us to know that it's safe. It's safe to put our swords down and just rest at your feet. And as we celebrate pride this weekend, we remember and lament the ongoing persecution of our queer siblings. Draw near to them as well, Lord. Be their defender, their shield, their comfort, and their joy. In Jesus' name, we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.